A very good morning, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. I hope uh, you're all coping well uh, despite the circumstances. Welcome to this briefing session on One Planet, One Humanity, the links between environment and emergencies, which is taking place within the framework of the Humanitarian Networks and Partnerships Weeks. It's my pleasure to see uh, so many of you uh, joining us today. I see we have representatives from governments, from regional organizations, from NGOs, from the private sector, from the academia, UN colleagues, and many more. So thank you so much for being here with us uh, today. I am Margherita Fanchiotti. I'm the focal point for response at the Joint Environment Unit of the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, and the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA. And I will be your narrator for this session. I will be joined by six respected guest speakers. You will have the unique opportunity to hear from my colleague Biar Ravi Shankar or Ravi, who is a senior project advisor with UNEP at the UNEP Crisis Management Branch. You will also have the opportunity to hear from Annika Salvik, a rostered environmental expert with the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency, MSB. And also from Ingrid Wong, Shivani Rai, and Niroj Sapkota from the Uni United Nations University um, Institute for Environment and Human Security. You will also have uh, uh, a chance to ask questions at the end of the session. And uh, I will uh, kindly ask you to type down in the chat box uh, any question you may have. So we will address them uh, then at the end and we will try to address as many as, uh, as we can. Over the next hour and a half, we're going to bring you on a virtual journey across the globe. Together, we will look back at the months that have passed since the declaration of COVID-19 as a pandemic, and we will explore how emergency preparedness and response have changed during the pandemic while ensuring business continuity. We will also navigate the challenges faced by governments and humanitarian actors in responding to the environmental dimensions of COVID-19. And in doing so, we will try to reflect on best practices, lessons learned, and the way forward. But first, before we begin this virtual journey, why are we doing this? Why environment and emergencies? I'm sure you can all think of many different emergencies, too many. COVID-19 is one of them, of course. We have seen other types of emergencies on, on the previous slide uh, that we will cover in this session. For example, the Beirut explosions, the ongoing uh, volcanic eruptions in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And whether it's natural or human-induced hazards, whether it's disasters or complex emergencies, we see that these are all intrinsically linked with the environment. I'm from the UNEPOCHA Joint Environment Unit, which is a partnership between the two agencies, and that really brings together the technical expertise of UNEP and the humanitarian mandate of OCHA. It is nearly 27 years old. It was founded in 1994, and it really embodies the humanitarian development nexus. The mandate of the unit is to support countries in preparing for and responding to the environmental dimensions of disasters and complex emergencies. And whenever there is an emergency, we can dispatch experts and equipment at the request of affected member states. We can perform rapid environmental assessments and we can provide remote support to really make sure that environmental considerations are integrated at the earliest stages of response before it's just too late to avoid any cascading negative impacts both in terms of you know, environmental impacts, but also uh, humanitarian impact. And the aim of all of this is really to save lives, livelihoods, and the environment on which people depend. Now, we've had 222 missions since 1994 of any sort, from response to preparedness and capacity building. And the large majority of them 75% and the core mandate of the unit remains on response. You see on the screen some of the latest deployments that we've had prior to COVID. And these are just a few examples of the many emergencies that we've been called to respond to. And it's not just deployments. We also provide remote support, which is particularly relevant when there are access constraints as best expressed uh, now under COVID. Um, we have always been providing remote assistance in addition to deployments, but uh, we have looked at strengthening this kind of support since 2018 when we established a dedicated mechanism, which is called the Remote Environmental Assessment and Analysis Cell. 
which has since been activated on, on, on numerous occasions. You see some examples uh, here on the slide, and uh, it has been especially effective in the face of COVID. With huge thanks to all the partners uh, involved, as uh, we will not be able to do this uh, alone. In fact, both for deployments, but also for remote support, we basically operate through a network of networks um, and we can count on a large pool of partners. And I see that many of them are, are here with us today. Thanks, uh, thanks for that. Now, over the years, we have responded to all sorts of emergencies and um, supplying all types of technical expertise. And as you can see, if you look at the pie chart on the left, um, about 44% of the experts that we dispatched were generalists, generalist environmental experts, whereas the remaining 56% uh, were specialists in fields that range from, you see it here on the slide, hydrocarbon and chemical contamination, to sampling and analysis, to uh, soil and water contamination, dam stability, wildfires, waste management, and you name it. And we've been called to support countries in all regions, as you see on the other pie chart to the right of, uh, of this slide. Now, if we look at trends in requests for international assistance that we have received since 1994, we see an overall increasing trend. However, when we look at most recent years, we see that the trend is actually declining. We receive fewer requests for international assistance nowadays, but deployments tend to be longer. They now average three weeks, and there tends to be more waves of deployments in rotations to match these longer durations. Overall, we are faced with a changing humanitarian landscape where we are witnessing strengthened local, national, and regional capacities in, in an increased ownership in some parts of the world. And this can explain the declining trend in requests for international assistance. Um, it also calls for a more localized and uh, decentralized response that can augment really this, uh, these capacities as needed. Um, and at the same time, the COVID crisis is also pushing us to rethink our delivery models and to look at enhanced uh, remote support. On the other hand, however, uh, we're also faced with the climate crisis, with increased temperatures, with more extreme events happening more frequently that are also increasing humanitarian needs in some of the, of the areas of the world that are already more stressed. So we see these two dimensions. And all in all, we are confronted with unprecedented challenges that require transformational change to make sure that we remain fit for purpose in this rapidly changing world. We need to prepare. That's the message. There is just no option for inaction. And uh, we have long been playing with fire. We have been flirting with disaster. And now COVID-19 has brought us all on a speed date with the future. Now, at the Joint Environment Unit, we use our convening power to connect the environmental and humanitarian communities, to foster knowledge exchange, and to develop tools and guidance. And I would like to invite you to check our two websites, the Environmental Emergency Center that you see on the left, where we have created a page uh, for COVID-19 to compile all dedicated guidance and resources, as well as IA Connect on the right. Um, this is an online repository of, uh, of guidance on how to integrate environment across humanitarian sectors and clusters. We also have developed a solid training program, uh, which uh, comprises both e-learning opportunities and field exercises. And on the same website that I was mentioning before, the Environmental Emergency Center, you will find five e-learning modules that are free for everyone to take uh, if you wish to deepen uh, your knowledge on the interface between environment and, uh, um, and emergencies. We otherwise also have an in-person training program and we run our flagship environment and emergencies training, uh, the one and only UN training on environment and emergencies, uh, which is designed for deployable experts to, to strengthen the skills required to operate in emergency situations. Now, of course, all of this changed with the declaration of COVID-19 uh, as a pandemic. And so we will now begin our virtual journey to uh, explore some of the milestones uh, that we have faced since then. So going back to March 2020 and up to today, we'll um, uh, explore some of the emergencies that we have faced in the meantime, and also the response, how we have supported countries in responding to the environmental dimensions of COVID um, itself. So first of all, just after the, uh, of course, the, the declaration of COVID as a pandemic, we've had to work on our business continuity plans to ensure that we will be able to still deliver 
uh, on emergency responses to, to still support and assist affected countries um, in, in responding to emergencies while also operating uh, in a pandemic environment. So we've mapped our capacities, we have reassessed all of that with our partners and our networks, and we've looked at how we could strengthen remote support through available mechanisms, but also through new initiatives to be able to still um, deliver. One of the changes that we've had to make, of course, was uh, like uh, everyone else to go virtual and go digital as much as possible. And that included also uh, our uh, training program. So uh, as we could not deliver the environmental emergencies training in person, we've launched a global webinar series um, on environment and emergencies in the face of COVID. Um, which was a huge success. We've issued uh, nearly 6,000 certificates and we cover different topics and uh, this is now available online. So I invite you also to have a look at that if you're interested in watching that. We will post all the links to uh, all the references that are made in this presentation in the chat uh, afterwards. Now that leads me to one of our first uh, uh, guest uh, speakers, uh, Ravi will guide us uh, through the remote uh, technical guidance that was produced by UNEP uh, to assist countries in responding to the environmental dimensions uh, of COVID-19. So I would like to welcome uh, Ravi and uh, Ravi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we can hear okay. you very well. Thank you. Now I'm going to do the magic of sharing my screen and let me see. Application. Share. Okay. Uh, does that work? Okay. I can't see. I can't see you anymore. So please tell me whether you can see my screen. Not yet. No. Uh, okay. One more. One more try. Share. <laughs> okay. Almost there. Very good. Yeah, how about now? Excellent. Now it works. Wonderful. So again, I can't see you guys, but um, uh, given that I'll be speaking, that's fine. The slide deck should be okay now. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone uh, from Ottawa, Canada. I, uh, as Margarita mentioned, I'll be speaking about environmental linkages of COVID-19 pandemic impact and recovery. Uh, there's a number of things that Margarita has already mentioned about the various initiatives. Uh, I will go over some of them. So the presentation today from my side would uh, just go over quickly some of the impacts of uh, the environmental impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. Some we already know. Uh, the others will look at the linkages, some that are not very obvious. And uh, so there are both positive and negative impacts. And then I'll go over some of the current and future support activities that we are involved in. So um, from an environmental impact perspective, you can parse it in many different ways. Uh, one of them is, you know, is the impact due to lockdown, pandemic lockdown, or is it because of post-pandemic recovery, as uh, we are starting to see uh, in some parts of the world? And then there are, of course, beneficial impacts, positive impacts, and then there is the detrimental impact. And some of these impacts are short-term, some are long-term. So let's examine some of these. The unintended positive impact of a slowdown in economic activity means that as the industrial activity reduced, as the uh, transportation on the roads reduced, uh, what we observed is that the air quality and water quality uh, actually improved. And uh, the traditional ways that uh, we saw uh, in the past that also reduced, the waste volumes reduced, the noise pollution reduced, and of course, because of fewer vehicles on the road and uh, lower economic uh, industrial activities, the fossil fuel consumption also reduced, which meant that the greenhouse gas emissions came down. Uh, there is also another element, side effect, which is uh, the tourism uh, 
sector uh, was quite uh, reduced, which meant that the nature got an opportunity to recover. What we have seen in reports is that um, some of the ri rivers are now like the turbidity and all that uh, have, uh, uh, the, the rivers have improved. Uh, ocean beaches have uh, become cleaner apparently. And some of the marine animals that we saw uh, that used to be there, but no longer because of human activities have returned. So all of these uh, things are good news side. However, as we quite well know, the negative impacts are also quite uh, severe. Because of the pandemic, what we thought we knew in terms of pre-pandemic daily life has been disrupted. The medical waste, hazardous waste from healthcare has reduced, I mean, has increased quite a bit uh, because of all the masks and other uh, personal protective equipment that uh, have uh, skyrocketed. World Health Organization actually a few years ago predicted that in case of a pandemic, there would be about five times increase in uh, medical waste. But uh, recently I heard that some of the past year's experience is that it has gone up as much as 12, 10 to 12 times. So uh, that kind of increased me hazardous medical waste has to be dealt with. Uh, there is also decrease in source separation, recycling and recovery activities because either people are not available or crisis management priorities have changed. There is uh, an increased stress on land space for waste disposal and management. And as you know, we are seeing everywhere that haphazard disposal of uh, personal protective equipment, unsafe reuse, of PPE by the informal waste pickers, uh, the informal sector, that sort of increases the risk to human health as well. And um, recently we are also noticing that there is a lot of um, unfettered uh, tree cutting for use of fuel um, and uncontrolled burning, whether it is uh, waste burning or uh, cremation, uh, in certain countries are uh, land space stressed because of uh, burial needs. All of these means that the impact on soil, water and air quality has uh, increased. And then, and of course, increase in plastic waste and risk to public uh, workers as well as public health and safety. The uh, other not so obvious environmental linkages other than the healthcare waste management that I just man I mentioned is the um, water sanitation and hygiene aspects in urban settings. What happens is because of lower economic activities, uh, the revenue coming into municipalities, for example, would reduce, has reduced, and that lower financial resources means that providing urban services as before is more challenging now. So the financial stress is having an impact on many of the environmental solutions that were being used before and that are available, but uh, difficult to implement. The impact on industrial pollution control, when there is a pandemic and reduction of, in, uh, reduction of industrial activity, uh, but a lot of crisis activities means that the environmental protection measures that are currently in place may be, people may turn a blind eye towards that. But as the recovery happens, there is a, an urgent need for economic recovery, socioeconomic recovery. Therefore, uh, there is a tendency for governments to provide a holiday in terms of uh, enforcement of environmental compliance laws. So that's uh, that rollback on environmental standards would have an impact, so that's another element. The other angle is impact on land use. I mentioned the uh, pressure on land use for waste management, et cetera, but there is also other component, food security. When there is a huge stress from people migration, 
um, lack of um, food availability in certain areas, the protected areas could be converted to farmland, and uh, those kinds of uh, changes would have an impact on land use and have a negative impact on the biosphere reserves and national parks. Now, these protected areas sometimes run based on the revenues that come from ecotourism. And uh, when that revenue reduces, they are looking for other ways of using the national parks. And that may mean that using it for natural resource or uh, again, farming and stuff, the livelihood alternatives that come with it means that uh, typically whenever there is an emergency, whenever there is a stress, environmental stress, typically women are the one who suffer the most. So that impact on women have to also be considered. This internal displacement of people, urban to rural, rural to urban, is again um, a component where uh, there are makeshift uh, camps uh, along the route. And these, this impact of humanitarian response when these things are not particularly planned well, and it is an emergency need, the environmental solutions that are used, whether it is um, camp sanitation, waste management, uh, sanitary uh, elements, uh, they are not necessarily sustainable. And so people turn a blind eye towards the best technology, best methodologies available because they just want to get things done to take care of people. And so when that happens, environment usually takes a backseat. So these are all the various elements. But then they, these are challenges, but it is also an opportunity for stakeholders. By that, I mean decision makers, the leaders, political leaders, policy makers, and general public. They have a time sensitive need. What do they need to do? They have to minimize the negative impacts of the pandemic as soon as possible. They have to focus on socioeconomic re recovery and then plan and manage this recovery in the right manner so that there is no subsequent environmental damage or environmental impact because of uh, poor plan. So in this aspect, UNEP, is, as Margarita mentioned earlier, we are working closely with other UN agencies, international organizations, experts, uh, et cetera, to support our member states in their crisis management and recovery planning activities. Now, UNEP support activities have taken a very strategic view. Uh, there are very uh, specific key areas such as medical humanitarian emergency phase, transformational change, investing in building back better, modernizing global environmental governance. So that's the holistic UNEP support. And within that, the crisis management branch is active in three major domains. We are active in providing advice on waste management, for example. We are importing knowledge on by having global and regional webinars. This is one of them, for example, uh, on COVID and environmental linkages. And then we are also providing assistance on post-COVID-19 needs assessment and recovery planning. The following slides will go over quickly some of the support activities that we are involved in. As uh, Margarita mentioned earlier, the UNEP OCHA Joint Environment Unit held the uh, global webinar series last year on environmental emergencies. It was a monthly uh, webinar over six months and these details are provided and the link for the webinar series is the Environmental Center is provided below so you will be able to access all the flyers, the information on the presenters, as well as the presentation itself. All of that is available. Um, at the end of December uh, 2020, there was also another webinar on lessons learned. And this was uh, provided by the experts from Swedish Civil uh, Contingency Agency, uh, MSB, and, and uh, looked at 
all the experiences over the previous six months on how UNEP and MSP experts um, did their work, what lessons did they learn on waste management around the world where they, where they went and assisted. The current activity that we are involved in, one of them happened last week, is the technical assistance training series. Rapid support on COVID-19 related waste management. Uh, on April 28th, there was one. And then uh, upcoming two training sessions would be on uh, June the 17th, as well as in August. So uh, keep an eye out for the announcements for these ones, more details will be coming. There's also a guidance on the COVID-19 recovery needs assessment, the CRNA is, and uh, the methodology was developed and environmental component was um, dovetailed into the socioeconomic assessment of COVID-19. As you can imagine, many countries look at this from a socioeconomic perspective, obviously. However, not everybody is an environmental expert and therefore may not think of including the environmental components in the same way as an environmental specialist uh, does. So what CMB UNEP did was to develop a methodology that was based on the post-disaster needs assessment based on lots of past experience uh, that UNEP has worked with the um, World Bank and the European Union and others. And a lot of that information is available on our website. And using that PDNA methodology, developed a new methodology that also included the environmental components, waste management, for example, and uh, helped prepare the guidance document. And then also provided assistance to various countries. One of them that is complete is uh, available online and that is for South Africa. You can use the link that's provided here. Go take a look, it's really well done, very comprehensive, and it covers a, a number of topics, including, of course, the environmental side, the waste management. The others that we are currently um, working on or supporting is uh, for Sudan, Afghanistan, Nepal, Zambia, Iswatini. And uh, we are also working with countries such as India, South Sudan, and Afghanistan to develop country baseline studies. That'll help in that. So uh, one of the uh, future activities is a joint UNEP UNDP workshop. It's on integration of this environmental aspect in recovery planning so that the country, UN country teams, as well as their counterparts in various countries, I'm talking about the um, uh, government counterparts, as well as the civil society organizations, etc., that our UNED country teams work with, um, they will be pr provided training and guidance on the process and methodology to incorporate when they start the recovering, recovery planning activity and when they are focusing on the socioeconomic side of things. Eco environment would also be uh, can also be included, and that would be the guidance that we would provide, and that's going to happen in July. And um, we will also be outlining the various expertise and resources that are available for the country teams and, and their counterparts. One of the uh, reports that we are finalizing currently, therefore it's not yet available for um, public, is uh, a global environmental assessment report called When Corona Came, Environmental Footprints of uh, COVID-19. It covers some of the elements that I have spoken today about, but in a, uh, a greater detail. So in conclusion, what I want to underline here is that uh, our crisis management branch continues to support member states through collaboration with other agencies and other international organizations. We are incorporating the lessons that we have learned over the last year and imparting that knowledge to member states so that they can benefit from it. And then the experience we have gained during this pandemic, uh, supporting various member states 
has actually increased our expertise in managing the uh, crisis, and that is the core mandate that we have. And so we look forward to supporting member states in the future on pandemic-related uh, recovery needs, as well as uh, any other um, emergencies that may come up. But I really thank you for your time. I will now stop sharing this slide presentation. Over to you, Margarita. Thank you very much, uh, Ravi, for this uh, very comprehensive uh, recollection of uh, the support that UNEP has been providing uh, to address the environmental dimensions of, uh, of COVID. Uh, could you kindly confirm that you can see my um, screen back? Yes. Yes, Excellent. I can. Excellent. I'm just sorry, just going to refresh it so that I can change the slides. Excellent. Perfect. So um, we have initiated, uh, uh, of course, uh, this uh, support on uh, on the environmental uh, dimensions of COVID-19 immediately um, uh, after the, the declaration of the of the pandemic, uh, but also uh, just a few weeks uh, after uh, the 11th March, uh, we received the very first request for international assistance uh, from Colombia, and that led to a remote uh, emergency deployment. Um, so this was uh, in, a transboundary, in response to a transboundary issue um, uh, following the sudden worsening of uh, air pollution in Colombia, uh, which was reportedly linked to waste dump fires in uh, Venezuela. So in response to this request for international assistance, we have mobilized remote support and the equivalent uh, form of, uh, uh, of an in-person deployment. So over two weeks, we have conducted uh, a rapid, neutral and independent analysis and have delivered a report to the authorities um, uh, to show the findings, preliminary findings, uh, uh, on uh, which, which actually proved uh, that there was no demonstrated uh, link uh, with the waste dump fires in, uh, in, Venezuela, in Venezuela, and that the air pollution situation was primarily linked to the ongoing fire situation across uh, um, the border. So this was a very first uh, uh, example of you know how we have uh, continued to respond and to deliver. Uh, on emergency response uh, in the face of the pandemic, and that was entirely uh, remote, and that was possible through the activation of the remote environmental assessment and analysis cell that I was mentioning um, before. In August, then, we had the very first deployment in person, and that was uh, to Beirut, uh, further to the port explosions that took place on the 4th of August. Um, I think most of, uh, of you, if not uh, all of you, will remember uh, having seen this in the news. So the, the explosions that took place at the port and that resulted from the detonation of uh, large quantities of ammonium nitrate. Now, the dynamics of the event remain uncertain and there is an ongoing uh, investigation uh, in, in, into the causes of the event uh, specifically. But what is certain is that this environmental emergency had a massive humanitarian impact. Uh, there were over 180 reported deaths, uh, more than uh, 6,500 people were injured, and about 300,000 people were displaced. And this was on top of the ongoing uh, crisis, multiple crises uh, in the country. So that this was on top of the impact of the Syrian crisis on Lebanon, on top of a deep economic crisis, and also, of course, on top of the COVID uh, pandemic. So it was yet another reminder of the catastrophic consequences, unfortunately, that environmental emergencies uh, can have. Now, in response, uh, to, well, as as uh, Maurice, one of the uh, of the people that were injured uh, by the explosions, recalls it, he had never seen a year like this before. So, with all this uh, uh, complex crisis interconnected, and uh, this, uh, you know, in response to these explosions, there was a very large uh, uh, mobilization from the international community. Uh, we have uh, through OCHA uh, a country office there, and uh, we also dispatched uh, a United Nations Disaster Assessment and Coordination Team, an UNDAP team, um, to support national authorities and the UN resident coordinator in country in responding uh, to this emergency. I deployed there along with Annika, who's also on the call and will uh, share her, her experiences uh, afterwards, to precisely look at the environmental dimensions of the uh, emergency. Now, one of the first tasks that the UNDAP team had to perform 
uh, upon arrival was to set up an international coordination structure because, of course, there were a lot of international responders that mobilized to, to support the authorities and support the national response efforts. So we set up an emergency operation cell and as part of that emergency operation cell, uh, we also set up an environmental emergency uh, cell. Now, the purpose of all of this is really to coordinate efforts, so to avoid uh, any duplication and to understand what the needs are and make sure that we're able to uh, then uh, address uh, response accordingly and, uh, and avoid any duplication of efforts and maximizing efficiency uh, overall. Now, from an environmental viewpoint, there were three main areas or three main uh, uh, environmental uh, concerns. One was, of course, linked to air pollution resulting from the explosions themselves and also from everything that exploded along with the uh, ammonium nitrate. Um, the second main concern was related to residual risk at the port. Um, there were, uh, as typical in, in, in ports, uh, a number of other chemical substances that, uh, that were found. We didn't have a clear picture of what was there before. Uh, the explosions and uh, and so one of the uh, key areas of support was indeed on uh, on mapping uh, those uh, those substances and identifying uh, them. And then the third area of support and the third main uh, concern was linked to disaster waste management. So to managing all the debris and rubble, uh, including hazardous waste that was generated by the explosion. I would like to just uh, uh, show you some of the products that we have produced uh, to, to support the government and also to visualize uh, these risks. So you see here uh, a map that we've produced using the flash uh, uh, environmental assessment tool, the FIT, it's one of our flagship uh, tools, and to show the extent uh, of the pollution resulting from the ammonium nitrate explosions. Uh, now, usually the chemical release happens very fast and the resulting toxic plumes are dispersed uh, within a few hours, but there are concern, concern over longer term uh, impacts and also, uh, you know, the, the toxic dust can resuspend, can deposit on surfaces and then resuspend uh, in the air uh, with the cleanup operations, movements, traffic, uh, etc. And also where concerns about uh, um, runoff uh, in, into water supply. Now, this map shows uh, basically the extent of that pollution. So that was um, uh, a little up to 0.2 kilometers, that's the red circle, and uh, harmful for human health up to 3 kilometers. We've also produced maps uh, to uh, visualize uh, the substances that were found uh, at the port and that also had to be either rescued or destroyed, depending on the type of substance, of course, and that presented uh, residual risk. And then we have supported in the development of a, a disaster waste management strategy, a comprehensive disaster waste management strategy that would include also considerations for uh, asbestos and uh, any other type of uh, hazardous waste that would uh, you know, potentially be found uh, at, uh, at the port. Um, so these are just uh, some of the uh, you know, key uh, environmental risks, of course, uh, that uh, there were of concern in the aftermath of the uh, emergency and during the, the UNDAC deployment. Um, and that ended up being covered, of course, uh, in the appeal and in the resource mobilization efforts uh, um, that, uh, uh, that came uh, after um, the mobilization of this uh, initial support. Um, the event, the emergency also provided lessons learned for ports uh, uh, globally. And I would like uh, now to uh, invite my colleague Annika to also share her experience, not only on the Beirut deployment, but also on the support that she has provided um, through a remote secondment to uh, the countries that uh, Ravi was uh, was presenting uh, earlier uh, to, so to Afghanistan, Haiti, India, South Sudan, and Sudan, as part of uh, uh, UNEP response uh, to the environmental dimensions of uh, COVID-19. So the floor is yours, uh, Annika. We're looking forward to hearing your perspectives as well. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my name is Annika and I am working as a uh, rooster person for MSP, the Swedish Civil Contingency Agency. And uh, this is the role I've had to all of this. First of all, good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all of you. Uh, I will repeat some of the things that was said uh, because, let's see, I'm trying to share my screen as well. Uh, a lot of these things uh, aren't connected and are well worth to be repeated. Uh, it's one uh, environment and we are all responsible to do the best and we need to help. And this is one of the things 
I would really like to emphasize, starting with the Beirut crisis. Uh, this was the first, as I know of, I might be wrong, uh, on site since COVID started, at least from a bigger issue. And working here, when people had not been allowed to be working together for real, physical, uh, really emphasized the need of working together and not caring so much from what organization you were sent, but to solve the problems both for as a humanitarian aspects, but also from the environmental aspects. And this is what was done. Uh, and working here, uh, which was really one of the first bigger movements since the COVID restrictions, uh, talking about difficulties of starting traveling when there really is no easy way to travel because all flights were more or less canceled for a while or, or at least decreased in number. But working here uh, really showed how much better you can work when you work together and working for the same goals. Uh, part of my personal work here was, as Marguerite told, was trying to find all these substances that could be a hazard, of course, mostly for the environment, but also for the people being uh, in the area and going <clears throat> to do the after work from the explosion. But as you understood, the explosion took most out of it and there was really not that many substances left. As you could see from the picture of Marguerite, the buildings were gone. But also, since a lot of buildings were gone, uh, there were no shade to some of the substances, which meant that they were exposed to the heat. And here we need to find, sometimes you need to find quicker solutions uh, to put these substances uh, under shade or cooling them down. And in some cases, it's not an emergency to do anything with them. And we only needed to map them um, and be sure that when people were entering the area that they were taken care of. Very good. The second thing I'm going to talk very shortly about is uh, the uh, one that also was mentioned before. When we were doing from MSB was asked uh, to assist uh, with remote experts. Uh, it's, it's, it was supposed to be for three months and it was supposed to start from July, but then we had a Beirut explosions. Uh, so uh, the employment did not start until later, which was, I think, a very interesting way of working because we were all working remote, all of us from Sweden. Uh, but what was good in this one which I think is one of the best lessons learned is that um, you mix all these experts uh, with different spe specialities and by working remote, there is no travel and you can meet, I know everybody almost can meet digital and we can work together solving uh, problems or making ideas or doing assessments and doing it with more people than what would have been a normal way of doing it when you send one expert for a while and then um, it's gone. So I think this is one of the um, very good learnings. Another one to join with the webinars, uh, which this one ended up in a webinar as well. I think uh, opening up webinars and seminars to more people have also strengthened our future capability of dealing in two ways. First of all, we can, uh, experts and specialists can give lectures to more people listening, but it's also a very good way of building the networks, getting the good ideas and showing the complexity of the environmental work. So COVID has had, as said, many bad things, but I also think this is one of the good things is that we are now getting better at working together, 
solving the environmental and the humanitarian issues, even if we need to do it in a distance. So I think by walking together forward together, uh, we will be better at solving the issues that we have ahead of us. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Annika. Uh, this was uh, really a, a very good uh, way to recall uh, also the different uh, delivery models and how you know our delivery models have changed uh, uh, under COVID. So thanks so much for that. I'm going to share back my screen so that we can continue. So just after uh, you know the uh, the port explosions in uh, in Beirut and uh, after we have initiated uh, this uh, this remote support to the country offices uh, of UNEP and the national government in the countries that uh, uh, that we have mentioned, um, we also deployed again, and that was the second uh, emergency deployment further to hurricanes Eta and Yota in Central America. I'm going to just uh, uh, cover very briefly uh, this emergency, but basically, as you may recall, on the 3rd of November, Hurricane Eta made landfall in uh, Nicaragua as a Category 4 uh, storm, and that impacted uh, other countries. So it moved over Honduras afterwards, and then it, making, it made its way to, uh, to Florida, passing through the Caribbean. And while the response to Hurricane Eta was still ongoing, then Hurricane Yota developed as a Category 5 hurricane, that was later downgraded to category four when it made landfall on the 17th of November in Nicaragua, just about 15 miles from where uh, ETA had made the uh, landfall. Uh, so several countries and notably Nicaragua, Honduras and Guatemala were heavily affected uh, by these two uh, hurricanes. Um, and uh, two UNDAC teams, uh, United Nations Disaster Assessment and Coordination teams were dispatched, one to Honduras and one uh, to Guatemala. Uh, environmental expertise was embedded in the team uh, uh, that deployed to uh, um, Honduras. And the key environmental concerns uh, related primarily to dam related water resources management, because there were several dams that were at risk of uh, overtopping uh, as a consequence of, uh, of the hurricanes, and particularly after Hurricane Eta and in the face of uh, Hurricane Yota. Then the potential spills of hazardous substances from industrial sites uh, of concern, and that was uh, in, uh, particularly to for Honduras because uh, the area that was uh, uh, worst affected uh, by the hurricanes, uh, by the Sula, the Sula was actually an industrial belt. Um, so that was one of the main concerns. And then overall disaster waste management uh, with also, of course, the access, uh, the resulting access constraints. Um, now, environment as part of the UNDAC uh, response, environment was mainstreamed uh, across uh, all lines of actions. So we were quite a few uh, environmental experts uh, deployed. Um, I see some uh, colleagues are also uh, online. So uh, the remote uh, environmental assessment and analysis cell was uh, uh, immediately uh, activated the same night uh, as uh, Hurricane Eta uh, made landfall and support was provided on real-time uh, emergency management operations at the dams of uh, concern that, uh, that I was mentioning, including uh, modeling. Uh, and then uh, all the facilities handling uh, hazardous substances, so primary industrial facilities, uh, were mapped. And then uh, again, the uh, flash environmental assessment tool that I also referenced for uh, Beirut was used to understand the extent of possible impacts for human health, but also in terms of soil and water contamination. Advice was extended to national and local authorities on debris clearance and taking into consideration, of course, uh, also hazardous waste uh, linked into the mapping exercise. Uh, environment was anchored to humanitarian needs assessments to make sure um, that we could promote, we could help in promoting a more sustainable and resilient uh, response. And of course, all key environmental findings and recommendations were presented to the national authorities and also to other international responders uh, for follow up uh, accordingly. So advice was uh, extended also on, uh, on risk uh, mitigation. So this is just another example of you know, one emergency after another that we were called to respond to in the face uh, of the COVID pandemic. So with all the additional constraints uh, related to that. And one more example was uh, moving on to, to March of this year, on the 7th uh, of March uh, in 2021, uh, where the BATA explosions uh, in Equatorial Guinea. 
Now, uh, again, some of you may recall this uh, from the news as uh, we understood it uh, after having deployed it there. Uh, the explosions uh, resulted once again from the detonation of uh, ammonium nitrate, and this was uh, from uh, uh, a civilian uh, uh, depot of explosives. And that led to a series of other explosions because basically that led to the collapse of uh, uh, buildings in nearby military barracks, and that led to the explosion of grenades and the ammunition that was stored in the military barracks. And ammunitions and so unexploded uh, ordinances were uh, spread all over the city with uh, extensive residual risks. And as an immediate consequence of those uh, uh, of that series of explosions, all the area that you see here uh, with a uh, red shadow was completely flattened. So only this building um, at the bottom right corner of this uh, of this slide. Uh, was the only building that stood up, um, and that's uh, because it had a 40 centimeter uh, reinforced concrete walls. Everything else in all that area was uh, completely flattened, and of course, uh, similar to Beirut, um, then the, the damages were uh, you know, found across the city, and there was, in this case, a very substantial, very high uh, residual risk linked to UCSOS, to an exploded ordinance uh, um, risks. The humanitarian impact uh, of the explosions um, was uh, basically in, in, in the explosions led to 107 victims officially um, uh, recorded, uh, but also uh, we estimated as part of the um, uh, the response uh, that uh, the support that we have extended uh, on response, we have estimated that 19,000 people were affected by the explosions, with about 8,000 people in need. Of humanitarian assistance, and that was around the key sectors that you see on the slide, and that were identified for the response. So, primarily around health, shelter, wash, food security, nutrition, protection, logistics, and education. So, once again, just like the Beirut explosions, it's another example of how uh, you know environmental emergencies can lead to this massive uh, humanitarian impact. In this case, it was a very localized um, humanitarian impact, but of course, for people that were affected, it had uh, substantial consequences. Now, in response to this uh, situation, two UN missions were deployed. A humanitarian mission under the leadership of the United Nations Disaster Assessment Coordination uh, team dispatched um, there, which I had the pleasure to lead, and then a security uh, mission under the leadership of ANREC, which is basically the regional mechanism of, uh, uh, of the UN to look at, uh, at explosives. So that was all the work that uh, really supported the countries in identifying, mapping, and uh, um, addressing uh, the residual risks linked to uh, to explosives, whereas we were deployed there uh, to look at the humanitarian impacts and to support the government in uh, and, and the UN resident coordinator in responding to those impacts. So uh, one of the main activities as a standard in these situations was to set up an international coordination structure. Uh, you see here uh, very similar to the one that we set up also in Beirut. So we also established an emergency operation uh, center. As part of that, there was also an environment cell uh, that was set up. And then, of course, we had representations from the different sectors that were involved. And we maintain a very close link with the other UN mission that was uh, deployed with exchange of information on, uh, on, on residual environmental risks. Now, in terms of um, the activities that were conducted there in support again of the UN resident coordinator and of uh, uh, the government, in addition to establishing the uh, international coordination structure and hosting uh, uh, regular intersector coordination meetings to foster collaboration across sectors, uh, we also supported on its assessment. So, provided uh, the methodology, developed a, uh, a method, and a leverage contributions from the different agencies that were. Uh, uh, present uh, in BATA at the time to conduct uh, um, coordinated assessment, coordinating its assessment uh, to inform uh, response plans. And environment was mainstreamed in all lines of action, so it was, of course, uh, included in uh, the assessment. Uh, it was also, um, we, we used, we made use of uh, coordination platforms uh, to collect, share, and, and gather uh, information on environmental risks. Uh, all information on the emergency was uh, uh, published uh, in, in, in the platforms that, used, uh, that we use for standard communication within uh, operational uh, 
uh, responders and also for the public. So you, you may check that uh, online uh, uh, as well. And all the findings and recommendations from the needs assessment helped also in the development of an emergency and recovery plan. So an appeal uh, to fund then both the immediate response needs, but also looking at the longer term uh, recovery. It was a particularly good example of uh, handover because although we deployed for just three weeks, um, then we had a very good collaboration, you know, promoting a one UN approach with the UN uh, Development Program, UNDP, uh, who took over as uh, part of their mandate on, uh, on early recovery. And so uh, I think it's, it's a good example of uh, the support that the UN can extend to, um, to authorities uh, over a longer period of time. So that's unfortunately uh, just uh, one more example of uh, of the emergencies that we still had to face uh, uh, during uh, the COVID pandemic, and uh, that had, uh, you know, in, in this particular case for both the battery explosions and uh, the Beirut explosions, they are really uh, pure environmental emergencies. So the uh, the links with the environment are quite uh, are quite apparent. Uh, we also have an ongoing uh, emergency deployment uh, right now to San Vincent and the Grenadines, and also to Barbados. Further to the volcanic eruptions that are still uh, ongoing uh, in San Vincent and the Grenadines from uh, La Soufrière uh, volcano. So we have dispatched uh, a, an UNDAC team of uh, 14 people, of which 12 people are located in San Vincent and the Grenadines as the main large team uh, on the ground. And then we have two colleagues that are uh, currently in Barbados, advising the government of uh, Barbados and operating as a satellite uh, team uh, of the larger team in San Vincent and the Grenadines. And this is in response to requests for international assistance from both uh, governments. Now, I have the pleasure to have uh, uh, with me today uh, Ingrid Shivani and Niroj, who will speak uh, about the kind of support that they are currently extending uh, to the mission. And that is uh, yet another example of a successful uh, remote engagement in support of operations on the ground. So over to you, uh, Ingrid, Shivani, and Niroj. We're looking forward to hearing about uh, your insights. Thank you. All right, thank you. So I'll just share my screen right now. All right. So good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Margarita for giving us the opportunity to present here today, which is about our still ongoing remote response to the St. Vincent Joint Environment Unit mission, all the way from Bonn, from uh, students' perspectives. So a brief introduction about us. We are a small multinational team from the United Nations University Institute for Environment and hum Human Security, also known as UNUEHS. We are all currently based in Bonn, Germany, and our team consists of four people with uh, Professor Jörg Sarsinski as our team leader, myself, Ingrid Wong, and my fellow colleagues, Nero uh, Sapkota and Shivani Rai, who will be presenting with me. The emergency response mission that we are supporting is for the La Sufria volcano eruption in St. Vincent, which is one of the islands in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the Caribbean. The volcano is located in uh, north, northern St. Vincent, as you can see on the map here. And back in late December 2020, increased activity at the site, such as effusive eruption and fires from magma rising to the surface was observed, leading to the local co-government elevating the alert level. And after over three months of close monitoring, on April 8th, 2021, seismic monitoring, uh, sorry, seismic activity changed significantly and uh, explosive eruption began the next morning on April 9th, sending ash plumes high up in the air and pyroclastic flows that could cause destruction along its way. The Prime Minister issued an Im immediate evacuation order for people living in the red zones closest to the volcano. And over the next days, multiple explosive eruptions occurred. And until now, the volcano continues to be in a state of unrest. Explosions could take place with little or no warning and seismic activities such as tremors and earthquakes are still ongoing. Apart from the seismic activities that are still ongoing in the region, there are also other cascading hazards that are affecting the area. Heavy rainfall has been reported across the island, reactivating the 
the uh, deposited volcanic ash on the ground, causing lahars, uh, mud and debris flows, landslides and flooding, and causing damages to houses and infrastructures that have already been affected by the eruptions. As you can see here, and the NEMO has issued multiple alerts for flooding and landslides as rainfalls continue on the island. And the cascading hazards might continue when hurricane season enters. So this disaster has led to over 22,000 displaced people with 85 shelters set up, no casualties, but it caused extensive damage to assets and livelihoods, as well as uh, as well as cost for recovery, which could cost an estimated of up to 50% of the country's GDP, and also compounding to the ongoing socioeconomic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is also important to note that the impact not only affects St. Vincent, but neighboring islands as well. After providing you with a situation update, here's when the Joint Environment Unit comes in. So as Margarita already briefly mentioned, the governments of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and also Barbados requested for international assistance strictly for technical advice on environmental aspects as the uh, local coordination uh, on humanitarian response is through NEMO, SEDEMA and the governments. And uh, they deployed a team of 12 plus two people uh, to the two islands, uh, which consists of environmental experts in different areas, such as geology, ash management, environmental pollution, green response, and also logistics support. And additionally, the remote environmental assessment and analysis cell was activated on April 15th. Prior to this deployment, such remote support is traditionally done on a bilateral basis between cell members and G the GU, uh, GEU coordinator. And this mission is the first time that the Joint Environment Unit outsourced remote support coordination to UNUHS, allowing more time and human resources for this mission, in which we have established contact with over 30 subject experts who are on standby to provide support for the team on the ground. And it is also observed that COVID-19 COVID played a part. There's an increased need for remote support as well as increased availability of remote support. And now I will pass on to Neros to talk more in detail about our contribution in this mission. Uh, thank you, Ingrid. Now I will take you through our efforts in collaboration with the JU in terms of uh, remote response. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yes. Uh, so, during the emergencies, uh, the importance of both the available information and unavailable information is very, very high. Uh, while disaster responders ideally should uh, operate within a standard set of information, these, these information uh, may not necessarily be uh, available in many disaster scenarios. Uh, simultaneously, this age right now uh, is uh, an age of uh, highly driven disaster response uh, situation not just from the ground, but also from satellites. And this collected information, some un among many of the characteristics should be, first of all, timely, as uh, gathering new or even old information requires human resources in emergencies. Uh, you need to work with very limited resources in those scenarios. Hence, the ability to collect um, and process data remains quite challenging. Uh, similarly, reliable sources are very difficult to find during emergencies. One um, example, which we can already see in the present context of misinformation uh, about COVID. Uh, similarly, the data that is produced should cater to all the responders. We uh, often talk about interoperability, and this also comes into play. Uh, while it also should be rapidly shareable, therefore, simplicity uh, is the key. Now, attaining all of these characteristics uh, of data may enhance the faith of donors in the acting organizations and simultaneously augmenting the credibility of the response unit. But how do the ground? Uh, how does the ground team uh, have to collect this information? This this is not even twenty percent of the websites. They would have to go through every single day in disaster scenarios looking for alerts, new information, advisories, press releases, anything they can get their hands on. Uh, not to mention the pre-existing hurdles of limited connectivity, power outages, and rapidly changing disaster scenarios. 
This will create nothing but frustration and confusion among the ground team where data is crucial, but so is time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, therefore, our solution, uh, an information system that we update remotely going through all these websites, which otherwise the ground team uh, would have to scan on a daily basis. Uh, in our system, we highlight, as you can see on the top, um, and advice on the ongoing alerts uh, followed by some of the key resources that is tailored to the uh, ground team's recommendations. After having discussed uh, this with the ground team, we realized that uh, some of the key websites, such as the humanitarian response um, uh, website, and uh, the the organizations that create maps, such as Map Action, uh, UNOSAT, they were key uh, information that were to be presented in the face of this uh, information system. Um, and additionally, all the daily information that we collect in total will amount to over 400 at the end of this mission. Uh, and given the time period and the incident, this information is already quite substantial. Uh, having them in just one single Excel file was not going to solve the problem of information overload. Therefore, we created categories once again based on the recommendations by the ground team uh, and filtered all the valuable information with regards to these categories. Um, issuing sources and dates. So you can th see them in three different slicers here, three filters. Uh, now you have all the information you need with these three filters categorized, prioritized, and organized, and also on a daily basis. Uh, here's an example of such filters. Uh, if you, yes, uh, you can see the number of sources um, uh, and dates that were selected in yellow and green uh, slicers. Uh, with the respective categories available on the red slide red slicer this is very simple to use uh, yet powerful uh, next slide please now in terms of the key resources um, the word cloud here on the left it shows the multiple categories available within our system with uh, within which situation report as you can see as the biggest one uh, among all of these categories uh, was the most updated category among all, as it is very valuable uh, information. Um, we used the information from governmental and non-governmental websites that issued situation reports, advisories, and so on. Similarly, uh, Map Action, EU Copernicus, UNOSAT were some of the primary mapping agencies that published GIS and satellite-based uh, imagery in collaboration with regional entities such as um, uh, such as CIDEMA and University of West Indies. Uh, additionally, in the different the disaster circumstances, you also tend to find out there are different sources of information. And in our case, we found that Facebook, in comparison to any other social media platform, was used uh, by the acting institutes in the region, especially for alerts. Therefore, uh, we kept a close eye on these credible Facebook pages. Uh, this also goes to show how the dynamics of the disaster information dissemination is shifting rapidly. Uh, now, in our response, our goal was never to miss uh, important alerts and also follow the local news as much as possible uh, by creating a list of engaged responders local to international in one place. Uh, this allowed these responders to talk to each other directly, saving time, um, and therefore our remote support supplemented to the current information collection system, all the while promoting the use of local expertise uh, in the region. Now to carry on with the presentation, I would like to hand it over to Shivani. Yes, thank you, Niroj. So, yes, I'll be talking on the benefits and limitations that we as a remote support team had to come across uh, in the course of our mission. And one such benefit was that having an information system wherein we had collected all the information and categorized it, we could support the ground team with by providing them with a the structured information. And as we had access to different uh, experts and scientists all around the globe, we could facilitate the communication with them and we could take, obtain in, uh, additional information that was utilized in uh, the mission. And also because we were updating the data on a regular basis, we in turn have created an inventory of data that can be used in future and especially in the post disaster recovery phase. But besides all the benefits, we did have some limitations as well, like the delay in the information because of different time zones and also because remote support team is highly reliant on technology. So if the disasters happened in any remote areas with no access to Internet or if there was any power outages, it would be difficult for us to uh, continue with our work. So that is one of the challenges. But fortunately, we didn't have such challenge in our mission so we didn't have any technical issue but this could be something that needs to be uh, looked forward to and could, should be 
are utilized, I mean, should be done, should be taken into necessity in future. Moving forward, here are certain reflections uh, from that we have gathered throughout the mission. So basically, we almost felt the same, not the same, but somewhat similar experience that we could have um, otherwise uh, experienced in an emergency response in an actual in the in field, because uh, like in the emergency disaster occurs, so the deployed teams are uh, are deployed immediately, and then they have to work under pressure, saving lives and also providing relief to the people. Likewise, we did feel that pressure and tension, although we were not there physically, but then in remoteness as well, we could feel the pressure because we had to obtain the information on time. We had to update the information and we were also involved in this mission all of a sudden without much preparation. So this was quite challenging for us. And also we did work overtime because we didn't have much working hours, no fixed working hours, but then eventually it was a great learning experience. and. With the help of, and we were encouraged to develop information system that has in turn enhanced our information management skills. But most importantly, what we learned from this particular mission was that all the theoretical knowledge that we had gained in our master's program, we could in turn utilize all these knowledge into practice, which was a great exposure and learning experience for us. And also because we had to constantly be in contact with the team on ground and also attend meetings, it was a huge networking opportunities for us. And taking all this into consideration, the knowledge that we've gained, the experience that we've gained, our next steps or our way forward would therefore be to yeah, uh, come, come, uh, come create a satellite inventory that can be utilized for research, for the research in future. And also, we don't want to just stop here in the mission. We want to continue uh, in this mission, but in our own uh, way. So we want to continue uh, conduct a research on this particular related to the mission through a master's thesis. So it has opened doors for a variety of interesting topics for us, and we will take forward with it to it. I mean, we'll continue working for, to, uh, in it with the help of master's thesis. And also we would, we must say that this experience was overwhelming, knowing the fact that our work and our effort was being utilized in some way or the other in contributing and helping the people in need, in, especially in the St. Vincent and Grenadines area. So it has motivated us to pursue a career in the humanitarian field. And yeah, on this note, I would like to end our presentation. Here is a group picture of our remote support team, which is based in Bonn. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for your patience. We look forward to your questions and we look forward to connecting with you all. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ingrid, Niroj, and uh, Shivani for this uh, brilliant presentation and, of course, also for the great uh, support that you are providing to the ongoing deployment uh, uh, to San Vincent and the Grenadines and, uh, and to Barbados. I think it's a great example of uh, the engagement of uh, the academia in, uh, in emergency response and also the engagement of the younger generations, which are very often leading on environmental and, and climate related uh, issues and, and mobilization. So thank you very much uh, for that. We will now uh, open the floor uh, for questions. We already have a few uh, questions uh, that were uh, posted here in the chat box, uh, or either in the chat box or in the Q&A uh, box. I would invite you uh, to continue posting them um, because we will try to address uh, uh, as many as possible in the remaining 15 minutes before uh, we close uh, uh, for today. So among the questions that we already have uh, received, I see we have a few that I would like to uh, extend to Ravi. Uh, so we have one question on how we can uh, overcome environmental issues with regards to the increase of biomedical waste generation. Uh, and then we have another question uh, also related to COVID response, which is uh, uh, what we think about uh, the possibility of having periodic lockdowns to recover the environment. So over to you, uh, Rabbi, for some reflections on this. Oh boy, the second question is a loaded one. <laughs> so periodic lockdowns, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm the right person to uh, provide an answer because neither am I a, a country decision maker or uh, an expert in the socioeconomic uh, recovery components. However, my personal opinion is that uh, policy making in a situation where you have to bring in the uh, social issues, the economic issues, the environmental issues together is very complex. And if you just take a look at Twitter or even the news around the world, 
many current governments are being criticized for the various actions that they are taking. And they are all scratching their heads for the same reason, which is, you know, how fast can I open the um, society for a recovery, uh, full economic recovery, or um, should I lock it down further? And all around the world, we are seeing uh, varied uh, experiments, varied uh, beliefs, and the proportional results. So I don't, uh, I don't know the uh, answer. I don't think there is a single answer for that either. Your first question was about biomedical waste. Um, the, it, it, as, uh, as the uh, presentation noticed that the, noted, the amount of uh, biomedical waste is uh, increasing, right? Because of the pandemic. Now, there are several different technologies that are available. And in fact, one of the upcoming presentations uh, that we have planned talks about uh, the various technologies that are available for the hospitals to handle the, uh, the biomedical waste. Of course, one of the guiding principles behind uh, waste management uh, and, and basically for all our environmental protection ideas is to try and handle the waste as close to uh, where it was generated in the first place. So, so that uh, the transportation and all the accompanying problems would be minimized. So uh, for hospitals who are generating biomedical waste, there are some technologies that are well known, for example, the um, incinerator uh, technology, but it has its own challenges. There is the autoclave technology, there is micro technology, some of the other um, uh, ones which are which have pros and cons. Uh, some that uses less water, some that uses more electricity, and of course, uh, quality assurance in terms of uh, temperature maintenance, especially for incinerator, that's a big issue. So all of those elements uh, will have to be taken into account in order to address the biomedical waste uh, that is um, generated. And of course, where the infrastructure is not great, as well as power supply and other challenges are still there in other countries, um, there are other interim measures that can be uh, taken, such as uh, controlled uh, disposal in a certain area, controlled burning, uh, even though that's not the recommended method from an environmental perspective. Uh, those things might have to be explored in order to look at uh, weigh the pros and cons of different risks of leaving things uncontrolled or controlling it in a certain manner and uh, having a uh, control disposal. So anyway, there are many different methodologies uh, that are available. I would invite you to uh, attend the other uh, training session that's going to come in a couple of months. And there are some other ones that are also available online from the past. Thank you, Margarita. Thank you very much, uh, Ravi. We also have a question that I would like to um, uh, ask uh, Ingrid, uh, Niroj, and uh, uh, Shivani to uh, reply to. The question is, um, or, or the comment is that uh, the remote teamwork is very good, but it would be useful to develop an analysis framework in advance to allow a quicker filtering of useful information from the overall information flow. For instance, in an island like St. Vincent, Send is a critical issue and would be a critical consideration in recovery and reconstruction. Similarly, with a country like Yemen and water, the reality is that information flows in a disaster needs to be prioritized. Any reactions to that? Over to you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. With regards to this, we, first of all, while making this presentation, funnily enough, uh, we were trying to um, not present the way forward section, rather recommendations and what we see as a lack in the humanitarian network and humanitarian response at this point. And uh, we realized that there are some dashboards that provide uh, certain support, they provide certain information, but uh, at the same time, we also feel the need 
to have a certain dashboard to add qualitative information. Um, I, we feel that there is uh, there are no such platforms existing yet or not that we know of. Uh, but if we were to create a certain dashboard uh, that would be uh, that can be upgraded um, based on any kind of disaster, be it volcano, be it landslides, uh, flooding, then um, we think that that could definitely help uh, standardize uh, the response. Um, feel free, Ingrid or Shivani, if you want to add something. Nope, I think it's uh, it it definitely is a good recommendation that, uh, as Nero's already mentioned, that we will uh, uh, originally we had recommendations, but thought of some of this um, from from our perspectives instead, and um, indeed, uh, as Nero, echoing what Nero's mentioned, that it definitely would be beneficial in the future that such a platform standardized. Uh, tailored for specific hazards could be developed developed. Excellent. Thank you very much uh, uh, for uh, for these insights. Yes, I also would like to mention. So, uh, as part of uh, you know the monitoring efforts uh, that also our uh, regional and country offices uh, do, uh, particularly on uh, on OCHA side. Uh, of course, they try to gather preliminary information and have, you know, a baseline data available at hand, what we usually call common operational data sets, but that's really basic information like administrative boundaries, et cetera, population data, et cetera. Um, and then on the other end, with the, on the UNEP side, trying to uh, have uh, environmental uh, uh, data sets uh, available, we have one platform, MAPEX, um, that is uh, a repository for that, for new special uh, data, just for environmental uh, related data. Um, but of course, uh, each time that there is an emergency and we're called to respond, there is so much effort in it that needs to be uh, you know, put in place to, to gather all the data and also to develop uh, frameworks. Now we have standard and, and standardized approaches. And I think this is one, uh, a very good example, uh, the, the, the work that uh, the three of you have, uh, have presented. I think it's a very good example of something that can be replicated in the future and that we can look at uh, standardizing and, and link into our existing uh, uh, tools as well because it's uh, it's it's indeed uh, uh, you know needed also to to have that in place uh, beforehand. Uh, we have another question uh, that I would like to hand over pass on to uh, to Ravi, um, which is uh, um, so we have a comment from Lady that says thank you for explaining the UNEP post disaster response and environmental assessments really appreciate it. Um, COVID-19 pandemic uh, is supposed to be the result of environmental degradation, especially at the human-wildlife interface. Is there any program under UNEP to conduct routine environmental assessments so as to prevent such biological disasters or pandemics in the future again? Over to you, Rami. Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have a straight answer for that. I'll have to look into it and get back to you on a specific program. What I do know about how the UN works, it is always based on an invitation by a member state. And so if a country feels that they have the need to do certain assessments, or uh, it could be multi-year, long-term program, but still the country has to invite United Nations to go help them. And of course, uh, then comes the funding and all of that uh, financial component of it, for which there are donor countries who uh, come to United Nations to uh, uh, see if there is alignment in terms of the program. So there are three components to this whole answer. One is the member state has to invite because they have a need, then the UNEP mandate and their overall prioritization on an annual basis are in response to things like this pandemic. That prioritization and the sustainable development goals, everything has to align. Then there is the donor countries who would come to the United Nations because they have a certain priority and they want to see UNEP uh, discharge this uh, particular project or program. So if these three gets aligned, that's when UNEP does the work. And um, so in terms of uh, 
ongoing specific programs on this particular question. Margarita, I'll have to take it offline and uh, get back to you. Perhaps you can post that answer later. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ravi. Uh, we'll uh, conclude with one more question, which was uh, if uh, COVID-19 is beyond the scope of humanitarian aid and it's only with government to handle. Um, so on that note, I would like to mention that uh, um, there was and there is a, a global uh, COVID-19 uh, humanitarian response plan that is targeted at those uh, countries that already had humanitarian response plans or were part of regional humanitarian response plans. Um, so the countries that already, um, you know, were uh, experiencing humanitarian uh, situations, and so that the the COVID dimension, the COVID uh, pandemic added an additional layer, an additional layer of complexity uh, to those ongoing uh, humanitarian situations. So uh, there is indeed a lot of uh, support that is being extended in that sense. So on 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 response to the humanitarian dimensions of uh, of COVID and how those have exacerbated uh, ongoing, uh, I mean, pre-existing humanitarian needs. Uh, and that includes also looking at uh, vaccine uh, uh, distribution in in, in countries uh, where uh, there are no national uh, um, uh, vaccination campaigns, or you know those are not uh, sufficient. So there is a lot that is going on also in that uh, in that sense. Of course, in this session, we are primarily covering the environmental dimensions of uh, of response to emergencies, including uh, to to COVID and the links between uh, environment and emergencies that. COVID has just once more uh, accentuated and reminded us uh, uh, about. Uh, so thanks uh, so much, uh, uh, everyone, for the uh, questions. I think we have addressed uh, uh, most of them, and uh, we have only three minutes uh, left. So it's uh, time uh, to wrap up uh, for this session. And I think so. We've had a chance uh, to look at uh, you know look back. At this past year, uh, since the declaration of uh, COVID-19 uh, as a pandemic, um, we were uh, we met in person at the last year's edi edition of the Humanitarian Networks and Partnership a Week in February 2020, just before uh, the declaration of the pandemic, when we were already looking at uh, uh, business continuity plans in the face of COVID, etc. And uh, and now we're meeting online for the first time. Uh, the uh, the Humanitarian Networks and Partnership Week is online. Um, so I think it was a good opportunity to look back at what has happened uh, during this past uh, year. It has been a very rich and eventful uh, year. Thanks so much for uh, for everyone's contribution from the different uh, um, guest speakers. It helped really in in the, in the recollection of uh, all those uh, milestone uh, events. Overall, I think uh, you know we see that in the face of the climate emergency and uh, of a changing humanitarian landscape. This paramount really to ensure that environmental and climate considerations are integrated and are anchored to humanitarian uh, action and that we all contribute to that and that we do that as a matter of urgency. And I think we must learn uh, from COVID uh, and we must all work together to make sure that we move on and, and we continue on a greener and more sustainable pathway uh, for the future. There are a lot of opportunity gains that can result from COVID. There is renewed attention to the need that the time to reconnect really with nature is now. There is a, uh, there are huge opportunities to really deliver on the data revolution. Uh, so we have seen and we've heard a lot of, exam of examples of, uh, you know, how we can make use of uh, of data and of remote um, remote support and the newest uh, technologies uh, to to continue to deliver and also to augment our capacities to deliver in support of uh, uh, national and uh, and local efforts. But it's only together that we can uh, do all of this and that we can make sure um, that uh, uh, we really uh, take the time to reconnect with the, with nature and uh, and yeah and and really make sure that this is understand that this is the only way that we can really save lives and also the planet. So thank you very much everyone for joining, all the uh, guest speakers for your interventions and also all the participants for uh, listening to us and also contributing with your uh, uh, questions, which was really uh, insightful for us as well uh, to, to hear from you. We will post the outcomes of this session, the recording and uh, any useful links that uh, we have referred to 
in the outcomes uh, session section of the page, the link that was sent to everyone on the official uh, uh, humanitarian networks and partnership week uh, website in the session page. So the same where you found the connection details uh, to join us today. So please uh, look back uh, uh, to that page for all this information. Thanks everyone for joining and have a great continuation. It was a pleasure to be here with you today. Bye. Take care, everybody.